This is the 18th and final video in our series on Israel's divided kingdom period. We've learned about 40 monarchs of these two kingdoms because they were archetypes of the respective kingdoms. And our goal has been all along to learn from their mistakes. We covered almost 350 years from history, 208 in the Northern Kingdom and 344 in the Southern Kingdom. And we learned that there were, well, plenty of mistakes to learn from. We've seen evil kings who repented, righteous kings who abandoned their faith, plenty of other kings who did remarkably selfish and stupid things at the expense of their own people, just like the prophet Samuel predicted. We've also seen how God has dealt with each of these rulers. Thirteen of the rulers were assassinated, one committed suicide, five were deposed and hauled off to prison, one was struck with leprosy, another died in agony with his bowels removed. Actually, only two, uh, King Ahab and King Josiah, died in battle doing kingly things. In total, 32 of the rulers did evil in the sight of the Lord, and only eight did what was right. Now it's time for us to make sense out of what we've learned. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Remember what I said at the very beginning? A wise man learns from his mistakes, but an even wiser man learns from someone else's mistakes. So what have we learned through this series? What do we have a better appreciation of now? What's the most significant understanding of God you received during this series? Well, I picked out nine things. Most of them are pretty obvious and don't require much elaboration. There's probably a whole lot more if you really stop and think about it. And, of course, that's our hope that this series has caused you to reevaluate and think about these things. But let's start with these nine, okay? God is a jealous God. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. No matter who or what you worship, serve, or devote your life to, the Bible makes it pretty clear there's really only one true God, and Yahweh believes that He's it. <laughs> if you belong to Yahweh, He, like a jealous husband, will not tolerate you sharing your love and devotion with another. 
if you don't belong to Yahweh, well, you still owe him your exclusive worship, service, and devotion simply because of who he is. Now, throughout the kingdom period, Israel is portrayed as an adulterous wife chasing off after other gods, lavishing love and affection on strangers. Even in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? God hasn't changed, and he's not going to share your love and allegiance with any other gods. Now, if you think back to our second and third videos, you'll remember that the entire divided kingdom period was fashioned by Yahweh to solve that other God's problem. Israel was trying to have it all, worshiping Yahweh, sort of, and worshiping other gods of their own choosing. People still do that today, and Yahweh still hates syncretism. Maybe our God is big boobs, money, success, or Harley Davidson motorcycles. Maybe yourself. <laughs> But if whatever that fill-in-the-blank is that distracts you from exclusive Yahweh worship, he'll do whatever it takes to eliminate you sharing your affection with anyone or anything else. So if you don't belong to Yahweh, well, you can give it your best shot, do whatever you want, and see how that works out for you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. God is faithful even when we're not. The Palestinian Covenant set the ground rules for living successfully in the Promised Land. If you do this, then I'll do this. But if you do this, then I'll have to do something you won't like. Both kingdoms were evaluated by their faithfulness to that covenant. And when they faithfully obeyed, things went pretty well. And when they didn't, things went terribly wrong. <laughs> what we sometimes fail to appreciate is that Yahweh was likewise bound by that covenant. He had to faithfully comply also. Once in place, that contract was in force whether Israel complied or not, but Yahweh had to live up to his end of the deal regardless. That Palestinian covenant was God pledging his word to perform certain things under certain circumstances for Israel. His faithfulness to comply wasn't dependent upon Israel's faithfulness. God cannot lie. He can't promise something and not follow through exactly as he said he would. Once he covenanted covenanted <laughs> with Abraham by walking through those bloody animal sacrifices his promises to Abraham were eternal unbreakable everlasting <laughs> there's no getting around them those dead animal parts actually represented what should happen to Yahweh if he were to fail to fulfill his promises to Abraham and Yahweh frequently remembers that covenant throughout the Old Testament, and that covenant, along with the Palestinian covenant, governs his actions throughout the entire kingdom period. Once he and Israel had agreed to that contract on the banks of the Jordan, Yahweh was bound to comply with the terms of the contract within the limits of his character and his previous covenant with Abraham. 
God always keeps his promise, good or bad, even when the promise seems contradictory. We saw how God faithfully kept his promise to King David while skillfully fulfilling his seemingly contradictory prophecy against Jehoiakim and his descendants. We may not understand what God has said, <laughs> that's a given, but we can rest assured that he does and he will always do whatever he says he's going to do. Disobedience always brings judgment. Now I have a number of problems with God's justice system. <laughs> so this section was probably the hardest for me to get my head around. I was really distressed to see how many times God delayed judgment until after the perpetrator had died. And it seemed to me like justice was meted out on the wrongdoer's family and quite honestly I'd much rather see the wrongdoer suffer himself and immediately <laughs> I guess I'm like the prophet Jonah mercy for me justice for everyone else <laughs> it happened all through the divided kingdom period but it goes all the way back at, at least as far as King David David sinned with Bathsheba but who died David's son Solomon sinned and his son's kingdom was divided Jeroboam sinned and his son died and then his entire lineage was murdered but all of this happened after Jeroboam wasn't around to see it Baasha died and his lineage was wiped out too and again he was long gone Ahab sinned and yes he died in battle but his wife's sons and extended family were all wiped out by Jehu and again Ahab was already long gone <laughs> the timing of God's justice really bothers me until I talked to a friend who reminded me some cultural differences between the values I grew up with and those in the Middle East now in America particularly individualism reigns supreme right all of our matinee idols are usually heroes who are exceptional at their job but they're usually loners can anyone even imagine dirty Harry going home to his wife and kids after a hard day at work <laughs> no <laughs> make my day can you even think of any heroes who had a normal family life <laughs> well few people's American dream is living a life worthy of respect and then providing the security for children grandchildren and great-grandchildren after you're gone let's face it Americans Westerners tend to think in terms of ourselves what we can achieve how comfortable we can be what luxuries we can afford and enjoy and if when it's all over there's any left for our kids well they should consider themselves pretty fortunate <laughs> it's like the bumper sticker I saw on the back of some big giant Winnebago going down the road that said I'm spending my kids inheritance <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the ancient Israelites thought in terms of the entire family unit it was their legacy their name that would continue on forever through their posterity for God to blot out their lineage was too horrible to imagine it's like erasing their name out of the pages of history just try to imagine how it would feel to know that you were responsible for destroying your entire family your name blotted out forever everything that you had ever achieved gone everything you had hoped for and worked for wiped out all because of you so maybe God's punishment wasn't delayed nearly as much as I thought at first 
It also bothered me that God apparently has no qualms about using liars, murderers, and assassins to further his plan and administer his justice. Think about that. <laughs> Baasha is only the first that comes to mind, but there were many throughout the divided kingdom period, and I presume there's probably uh, people fulfilling that purpose today. Baasha conspired against his king, King Nadab, murdered him, and then went on to murder Nadab's entire family. Now, Scripture clearly shows that God specifically selected Baasha and made him king for the express purpose of wiping out Jeroboam's family to fulfill the prophecy God gave against Jeroboam. He picked Baasha knowing that Baasha would be as bad or worse than Jeroboam ever was. On the national scale, both Assyria and Babylonia were fierce warring nations who conquered most of the known world in their time. God actually helped them overpower many of the weaker, smaller nations around them to become world powers. Uh, he specifically says of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, I will hand all of your countries over to my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the judgment pronounced on these countries didn't fall on the actual conquerors, those people who did the pillaging, raping, flaying people alive, hanging people on the poles to die, stealing and pillaging. It once again fell on their descendants, people hundreds of years later who were just trying to hold their crumbling empire together. God had no problem using these ruthless nations to inflict judgment on Israel, and apparently a lot of other nations too, and then disposing of them when he was done. Now, God can't sin. And he doesn't condone sin, but he certainly seems to have no problem whatsoever in using the sinful thoughts and actions of others for his purpose. Speaking of liars, deceivers, and murderers, Satan himself is the ultimate sinner. We saw how God used Satan to punish King David and the nation Israel. He also used a lying spirit to trick King Ahab into placing himself in harm's way and getting himself killed. It certainly seems that God can and does use any and everyone to accomplish his purpose. Afterwards, as we've seen, he disposes of that tool and just picks up another tool. Knowing God's eventual justice is comforting when you think about people like Adolf Hitler. A bullet in the head was just too good for him. Evil men will eventually receive the justice that they deserve, whether I'm around to see it or not. And that is comforting. Repentance always brings mercy. No matter who he was, no matter how evil he was, if a king repented, God always extended mercy. Thus says the Lord, You abandoned me, so I have abandoned you to the hand of Shishak. Then the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is righteous. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. They have humbled themselves. I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be servants to him, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. Rehoboam was not 
one of the righteous kings. The people of Judah and Jerusalem did not deserve a break. They were already sinking into synchronistic worship and doing the detestable things with other gods that the northern kingdom of Israel was doing. Five years into Rehoboam's reign, God brought Pharaoh Shishak against Judah as a direct result of Judah's sin and Rehoboam's disobedience. Judah was completely overrun. But when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the Lord relented and postponed judgment. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster upon his house. Ahab was confronted by Elijah after killing Nadab and his sons to steal their property. He was a thief, a murderer, and a Baal worshiper, and that's just the first three I can think of. But when Elijah told him that disaster would befall him, Ahab tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted, and went around meekly. He repented. And the Lord said, Because he's humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty, and heard his plea, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Manasseh was probably the vilest king in the southern kingdom. God had the Babylonians haul him off to prison. Manasseh humbled himself in prison and sought the Lord. God heard his prayer and restored him to the throne. This is just the way God is. Repentance always, always brings mercy. If God is so willing to extend mercy to these three non-believers we've looked at, how much more merciful is he to his own children who repent? Well, we also learn that human righteousness is not so righteous after all. God actually considered some of the kings in the southern kingdom to be righteous kings, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, <laughs> whatever that means. Yet these guys were far from perfect. Uh, they couldn't even see perfect from where they were standing. I believe I said somewhere in one of the earlier videos that I'd not want any of these guys on my church board, maybe Hezekiah, but maybe not. Asa took God's money and gave it to Syria to attack Israel. He didn't trust Yahweh to protect him. In later years, he turned his back on Yahweh. Josephat repeatedly disobeyed God. He formed political alliance with non-believers, and his actions nearly destroyed the Davidic line. Um, this would be probably, in New Testament terminology, we would call it being unequally yoked with non-believers. Okay, Joash was a murderer and an idolater. Amaziah was prideful and also an idolater. Azariah was another king who thought way too highly of himself, and Hezekiah trusted Egypt to save him from the Assyrians, and then when that didn't work out, he stole money from God's temple to buy off the Assyrians. In his later years, he became prideful and ungrateful when God healed him. These are the righteous kings. <laughs> They're no better than you or me. We make the same stupid mistakes sometimes 
and like <laughs> what is it Jehoshaphat sometimes repeatedly making the same stupid mistakes when they quit relying upon the Lord they just went off the deep end Well, there's a big difference between human alliances and divine protection. Both Israel and Judah frequently looked to Egypt for help instead of Yahweh. <laughs> Egypt never came through. Why did they keep turning their back on Yahweh and running to the nation that it had enslaved them for 400 years? I don't know. They kept making treaties with their old enemy Syria or Aram, but Syria kept switching sides and actually attacked them more often than it helped. Shouldn't they have looked to Yahweh for protection? Shouldn't they have simply obeyed Yahweh, followed his instructions, and relied on those promises in the Palestinian covenant? No amount of wealth fortification or political alliances can substitute for Yahweh's protection and nothing can afford protection to those who turn their back on Yahweh go up to Lebanon and cry out and lift up your voice in Bashan cry out from Abiram for all your lovers are destroyed I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. The wind shall shepherd all your shepherds, and your lovers shall go into captivity. Then you will be ashamed and confounded because of all your evil. Yahweh assured that both kingdoms would pay a high price for turning to others instead of him because he is the only reliable source of salvation. Yet they continually turn to Egypt, Assyria, Syria, and other gods for protection. Both King Jehu of Israel and then King Ahaz of Judah tried to find safety by asking Assyria for help. That didn't turn out very well for either of them. Here's that picture of the black obelisk of Shalmaneser again, showing King Jehu on his knees paying tribute. In the end, Jehu's dynasty was still wiped out, and Ahaz's appeal for help not only destroyed Samaria and ended the northern kingdom, but it turned over control of the southern kingdom to Assyria and caused immense problems for his son Hezekiah and other kings after him. When Assyria later attacked Judah, Hezekiah tried to buy him off to no avail. Assyrians hauled off Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. Uh, Jehoiakim changed alliances like he changed his shirt, but no amount of political maneuvering could save him. He was controlled by the, the Egyptians who killed his father and took over his country, but he swore allegiance to King Nebuchadnezzar and then he was controlled by the Babylonians. Then he switched back to Egypt again. <laughs> it hadn't worked for Rehoboam. Why? It hadn't worked for Hezekiah. <clears throat> so why would he think that it would work for him, huh? These alliances got him worse off than better off, and he ended up being murdered. And then what about King Zedekiah? In spite of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, he also sought protection in a secret treaty with Egypt. It totally failed. His actions led directly to the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the southern kingdom, and him getting his eyes poked out. On the other hand, there's many instances where kings relied on Yahweh, and in every single instance, Yahweh came through for them. Every time when Yahweh brings trials and testings into your life, albeit Assyrians, Babylonians, a difficult spouse, or maybe that jerk who cut you off in traffic, you're far better off relying upon Yahweh rather than scheming, planning, trying to 
by your justice and protection. And don't even think about having a big 401k and money in the bank <clears throat> that that w will save you. All these kings had plenty of money. And then you see what that got them. <laughs> they had a lot more money than you and I will ever have. Good times or bad, don't make the mistake of turning from the Lord to anything else, particularly some stupid human solution like many of these kings did. Now, I'm not saying that you're supposed to sit on your hands and do nothing. I'm just saying, find out what the Lord wants you to do first, and then do it. These guys had the instructions right in front of them. All they had to do is follow the instructions. They just didn't do it. The righteous king Hezekiah had the God-given responsibility to protect his people. He took concrete steps to do so. He built that wall, um, the tunnel, uh, and then he destroyed the water supplies for miles around to deny access to his attackers. But in the end, Hezekiah recognized that Yahweh's control extended over him and his entire city. Yahweh was responsible to protect the city, so you should too. Unfortunately for us, many powerful nations today are acting just like Israel and Judah before their inevitable destruction. <clears throat> kind of makes you a little shaky sometimes. Looking at the current events, uh, most of the countries have turned their back on the Lord, ignored his counsel and instructions, and are just running amok with their own plans and strategies to save the environment, to uh, stop nuclear proliferation, um, get guns off the streets, whatever. Everyone is paying the price. The Lord is bringing every conceivable problem against us, not as punishment, but to get our attention and teach us, as he did with Judah and King Rehoboam, that, quote, we may learn the difference between serving me, the Lord, and serving the kings of other lands, unquote. Well, the good news is that it's never too late to turn back to God. God always extends mercy to those who truly repent. God can use anybody. And a lot of times it's the people you never heard of. Yes, God uses big-name prophets like Elijah and Elisha to do big things. But most of the time, it's everyday people like you and me or the man with no name. It's just somebody who shows up, does whatever God wants him to do, and then quietly rides off into the sunset. Sometimes it's not even a believer. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> God can easily speak through non-believers, atheists, pagans, donkeys, <laughs> anybody else he chooses to use. All truth glorifies God, no matter who says it. You just have to have ears to hear. The Invisible Hand of God in World History I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Sometimes Yahweh tells people ahead of time what he's going to do. Just give him a peek into the future. Uh, sometimes he specifically directs individuals to do something, as with the case of Elisha anointing Hazael to be king of Syria, or Ahijah the Shilonite uh, going to Jeroboam and telling him God was going to make him king of the ten tribes of Israel. Other times God just simply causes things to happen, like Baasha overthrowing King Nadab, 
we find out later that God caused Baasha to become king for the express purpose of destroying Jeroboam's lineage. <laughs> it's pretty obvious in the Bible that God is in complete control of his creation, every aspect of his creation, controlling the weather, telling animals what to do, even influencing humans to say and do whatever needs to be done in order to accomplish God's purpose, regardless of their own personal motives or decisions or desires in the matter. The classic example, of course, is the division of the kingdom by means of Rehoboam's poor decision. <laughs> God had already told Solomon and Jeroboam that he was going to tear ten tribes away from Solomon's son and give them to Jeroboam. <laughs> it was already a done deal. Well, Rehoboam was Solomon's son, so you would have thought that Solomon might have mentioned something about this, <laughs> but he apparently didn't say a word. He just let it all fall on his son as a total surprise. Nevertheless, Rehoboam did have the free will to and responsibility to make the best decision he could in this situation. But there's really no way he could have avoided what God had already intended was going to happen. I mean, he was screwed. <laughs> he could go ahead and gather information, ask for advice, evaluate all the alternatives, choose the best course of action. But it is no mere coincidence that Jeroboam freely chose to do exactly the thing that would accomplish God's purpose. He chose poorly. Rehoboam probably regretted this poor decision the rest of his life, but really it was only a poor decision from Rehoboam's perspective. From God's perspective, this was not some accidental blunder on his part. It wasn't a poor decision. It was exactly the right decision that was needed to be made at the exactly the right time to accomplish God's intended purpose. In fact, 1 Kings 12.15 says, The king <clears throat> did not listen because the Lord caused it. Rehoboam's willful decision was merely the vehicle God used to accomplish his will. And since the entire divided kingdom period demonstrates God's direct intervention and manipulation of world history, events, and people, it's pretty safe to conclude that he continues doing so today as he guides his story to the predetermined conclusion. Ahab and Josiah <laughs> were two other guys who tried to beat the odds playing against God. <laughs> they wore disguises into battle. <laughs> they lost. They got killed by random arrows. In Ahab's case, a prophet actually predicted it ahead of time. He was going to die in battle with the Syrians. And sure enough, <laughs> he did. In Josiah's case, it was the pagan Pharaoh Necho who told him, Stop opposing God or he will destroy you. And again, that's exactly what happened. Does anyone seriously think that these were mere coincidences? Can there really be such a thing as an, a random event or some stray subatomic particle floating out there totally outside the control of the sovereign controller and sustainer of the universe? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Maybe we should think about this the next time we buy a Powerball ticket. <laughs> 
the winner is already predetermined. <laughs> we just don't know who it is yet. King Amaziah of Judah was a righteous king God decided to kill for worshiping other gods. He indirectly provoked a battle between Judah and Israel in which Amaziah was captured, hauled off to prison, and murdered by his own people after he got out of jail. <laughs> Not free. Second Chronicles 25.20 shows God's complete control over all these events. Amaziah would not listen, for it was of God, in order that he might give them into the hand of their enemies. Jonah was a prophet who lived during the times of Jeroboam II, just about um, 60 years before the Assyrians would come in and wipe them all out. God told Jonah specifically, go to Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah exercised his free, quote-unquote, will and chose to go the opposite direction. Well, then God exercised his free will and offered Jonah a lift in a big fish and gave him some time to think about his decision. Jonah again exercised his free will and decided to do things exactly the way God wanted him to do it. He became willing to be willing. Ahaziah of Judah was the grandson of King Ahab and therefore under God's death sentence. God ordained that he would die by visiting his uncle Joram in Israel and unwittingly Ahaziah chose to do that very thing. Somehow God influenced Ahaziah's free will so that he would choose to do what would accomplish God's plan. Jehoram was another evil king of Judah. Uh, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and as punishment, God incited enemies to attack him. Now, whatever the reasons uh, or motives of the Philistines and the Arabians for doing so, their free choices were exactly what God intended them to make at the exact time he intended them to make them. One <laughs> has to wonder how many people in Philistia and Arabia did God have to influence their decisions in order to get those nations to attack. But again, it was their free will acting as a vehicle that God used to accomplish his free will to punish Jeho Jehoram. In all these instances, and really many more instances throughout history, God's invisible hand is at work guiding, influencing, directing the th thoughts and actions of individuals, leaders, to accomplish his own goals, regardless of whatever reason the individuals may have, if God can cause Rehoboam and Amaziah to make seemingly poor choices, if he can entice Ahab and Ahaziah into situations where they'll be killed, and if he can orchestrate decisions and actions by these other world leaders around Israel and Judah to further his plans for his people, He's probably in control of our lives, too. <laughs> Never, ever think that your free will is stronger or takes priority over God's free will. That's just not the way it is. And number nine, you can trust what the Bible says. Scripture is not specifically a history book, although it contains a great deal of history, but when it does speak to historical facts, it is accurate. In every instance where there's been a discrepancy between what the Bible says and what, <laughs> what we think history has been, has been resolved in favor of the Bible. It has substantiated the Bible's accuracy. 
for almost 2,000 years, historians and Bible critics have scoffed that the Assyrians never existed. The Bible was simply wrong. Then in 1842, Nineveh was discovered. Seven years later, they found the palace of the king they said never existed, King Sennacherib. Now we know as much about the Assyrians and their culture and lifestyle and how they interacted, even writings that they have, We've, we know as much about them as we do some of the people groups living on our planet today. Sennacherib recorded his battle against Judah's fortress city, Lachish, on the wall of his palace, verifying the Bible's historicity. In fact, the 17th century was a fantastic time for proving the accuracy of the Bible. Uh, that king critics said never existed actually recorded his eight military campaigns on a six-sided column discovered in 1830 called the Prism of Sennacherib. His own written account confirms the biblical record of the destruction of Lachish and Sennacherib's failed attempt to capture Jerusalem from Hezekiah. Uh, the picture on the right was found in his palace, and it's a picture of him and his dad, Sargon II. Lachish is one of the most significant and visible archaeological sites in Israel today. In 1935, Jewish letters were discovered there in a guardhouse confirming Hoshea's treaty with Egypt during the period of Nebuchadnezzar II. And Judah's king Hezekiah dug a tunnel to bring fresh water into the city when Sennacherib was um, besieging <laughs> Jerusalem. Uh, this was discovered in 1838 and again verifies the historicity of the Bible. Here's a fragment from a monument discovered in Dan. The, the inscription confirms King Hazael's reign in Syria and verifies the reigns of Israel's king Joram and Judah's king Ahaziah. Most importantly, it includes the phrase, House of David. And this is the first known extra-biblical reference to King David. Before this was discovered, there was no reference any place outside the Bible about King David. And, of course, scoffers scoffed. <laughs> well, quit scoffing. <laughs> These are just a few of the many archaeological discoveries substantiating the Bible's historical and factual accuracy. We can trust it. In those areas of dispute where modern science or whoever purports to disprove the Bible, we have overwhelming historical evidence supporting our continued trust in Scripture. Today, as man's wisdom screams that Jesus couldn't have raised from the dead. I mean, that's just stupid, right? A worldwide flood is totally impossible. And over millions and millions and millions of years, man evolved from a rock all by himself. <laughs> you can still rely on what the Bible says because the ground is full of evidence to the contrary. It hasn't been proven wrong yet. And time is on our side. As more discoveries are uncovered, more questions will be resolved. These are just the first nine lessons I could think of. They're probably <laughs> just the low-hanging fruit on the tree. Now, we could probably explore free will versus God's sovereignty in a lot more depth. We could certainly draw comparisons between them sacrificing their children to appease the gods to our killing unborn children today for economic or political inconvenience. We could look further at the instances showing where Gentiles exercised a lot more faith in Yahweh than even his own people did. 
or ponder just how much God loved all those pagans he didn't reveal himself to or make an agreement with like he did with Abraham and the Palestinian covenant. The list goes on and on and I hope that you'll be interested enough to try to find out more information. There's a lot more lessons from the divided kingdom period and that's probably why God devoted nearly 40% of the Old Testament to recording this 8% time period in such fine detail. Most of all, we should realize God not only knows the future, but he controls the future. He's planned the future. Yahweh is directing his story to its foregone conclusion. Even when Yahweh doesn't directly instruct these kings what they should have done and said, what decisions they should have made, each actor on the stage faithfully played out his part in moving the entire divided kingdom story along to its scripted ending. It's the same for us today. No matter who or where we are, we're actors on the stage of life, and we have parts to play, places to be, lines to speak, and God writes the script, blocks the scenes, and he directs us. Even our mistakes, <laughs> or seeming mistakes like Rehoboam, are an important part of the big story. All we have to do is trust the Lord, learn from our mistakes, follow his directions. Looking at what's happening in the world today, it's easy to get distracted, discouraged, even depressed. Things just seem to be going to hell in a handbasket. But that was just like it was with Judah and Israel, right? During the divided kingdom. So we've got to keep in mind who's the director, producer, and author of this story. The hero that makes his dramatic appearance and then returns in the last scene to right all things, reward his faithful, and rule on the throne of David, just as he promised so long ago. Think about that when you're on your way to work or school or wherever you need to be. Whether your day goes exactly as expected or whether it goes completely <laughs> wacko, remember God is still in control. He's still interested in all the little details of your life. When enemies seem to be closing in on all sides, what are you going to do? Are you going to turn to Egypt? Or are you going to trust Yahweh? When your friends betray you or the doctor gives you that real bad news, are you going to run off to Assyria, Aram, or some other god? Or will you remember and learn from all these guys' mistakes? You're just like these kings of the divided kingdom. In each situation, you have a decision to make. The question is, will you trust Yahweh? What does Yahweh want you to do today? Ask him. And when the final curtain comes down, and it will, will you be rewarded for doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord? Well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. <laughs>